sensational, I think, to be able to do something I've wanted to do for a long time, <clears throat> but have uh, shied away from doing it for many reasons, and that is to talk about some of the interesting things that have happened to me. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know how important they might be, but but they are interesting to me, and I thought I'd like to at least reminisce over some of the strangeness in my life. And God knows I've had a lot of it. Well, I know a little bit about some of it, and it has been phenomenally fascinating. Uh, what you, even as a little boy, it started. I mean, these things are just uh, remarkable. So uh, we had an email, uh, and two of them, I think, from uh, people who are looking very much forward to hearing some of your strange events. So let's let's go to it. Okay, well, I think I would like to start off by just giving you some background about my family. Uh, when I was growing up as a kid, my mom used to tell me from time to time, you know, we'd sit uh, and talk about the family, and I would ask her about my grandfather and about the family, and, and, uh, and you know, as a kid, and she would always tell me that you are from the Carroll family, and she would always spell it C A R R. O double L Carroll family, and she said your your family and ancestry goes back to Virginia and Washington D.C. The uh-huh. John Carroll family, uh-huh. and so of course that and two bucks will get you a cup of coffee. I have no oh, idea yeah. what she's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, it wasn't, and and I, I I remember her talking about that quite a few times, and she even talked with the. Uh, Senator Claude Pepper on radio about the Carroll family, and I remember Senator Claude Pepper talking about the Carroll family and, and, and my mom and her family. <clears throat> so I know there was some validity to it because yeah. I heard a congressman or a senator, senator. Uh, you know, agreeing with her. Mm-hmm. And so uh, <clears throat> it wasn't until later in life, back in the year, uh, I guess, 90s and mid-90s, when I came across a book called Rulers of Evil by Tupper Saucy. Rulers of Evil. And it's on my website under recommended materials. You can go get it there. But um, <clears throat> in the book, Tupper Saucy talks about the founding of the United States of America. Uh-huh. And he talks about the, the family that was very, very instrumental, was called the Carroll family. Uh-huh. From, uh, double Virginia. R, double L. Right, and, and and he said that uh, the Carroll family was a, if I'm not, if I'm remembering this correctly, as a as a, a Jesuit Catholic family, a very wealthy mm-hmm. at the founding of this country, very wealthy family, and so <clears throat> when George Washington and the founding fathers needed a place to set up the central government, the federal government. Uh, he brought out in his book that it was the Carroll family who donated the property, which today we refer to as Washington D.C. Oh, is, it, is that then, all? It was, huh? it, just it was just part Washington of a, D.C. Uh, yeah. yeah, Washington D.C. was <laughs> owned by the Carroll family, and it was uh, donated to George Washington and the founding fathers as a donation. And then when I read that, I thought. Wow, that's what my mom was telling me about the Carroll family. Then later on, uh, the the movie came out, uh, National Treasure, and uh, and in the beginning of the movie, National Treasure, it's about the Carroll family. And as a matter of fact, one of the very first scenes in the movie is Martin Landau, that sensational actor. Martin Landau is is uh, in a, a horse covered a horse carriage and they're getting him out of town and it's a stormy night and 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 beneath him on the screen it says the carol john carol of the carol family Hmm. and that was in national treasure the very opening scenes in national treasure and uh and so I, i was shocked again there it is in movies the carol family and so uh, the bottom line is, is that for whatever it's worth, I just thought, you know, I'd like to tell you, I'd like for somebody to know, not that it's going to do me any good, but, <clears throat> but that my family, the Carroll family from Washington D.C. and Virginia area, 
was my ancestor. So in a point of in point of fact, I, I, I've often mused that if I had the money, I would like to hire a really, really uh, a high class lawyer firm, law firm, and sue the flying hell out of Washington D.C. and demand my property back. My family gave it to the people of America, not to the fascist. Uh, murdering uh, criminals that run our country today. I would like my po- I'd like my property back and get all of that crap off of my property. So That's really fascinating, Jordan. Amazing that your family donated Washington DC yeah. the property to the government re- of these now rotten mom, United States. Yeah. Yeah, and my mom used to tell me that all the time and like I said it wasn't mm-hmm. until I was much older, <clears throat> but I did remember she talked on the radio one time on ABC Radio in Los Angeles uh-huh. uh, when when Senator Claude Pepper, who was the highest ranking Democrat at that time, mm-hmm. uh, was happened to be on the air and she called and was talking to him and I was in the other room listening to the conversation and I remember Senator Claude Pepper talking about yes the Carroll family and your family was the Carroll family, and et cetera, et cetera. And he went on talking about the importance of that of that name and, and what my family had done. And so I just thought that was interesting. I'd like for the, you know, like I said, I don't know where it could go, but I just would like for the world to know it was my family that owned the property that we call today Washington, D.C. Let me ask you a question or two about this. This is fascinating. Uh, the Masonic and Luciferian, impact that was laid on the land that your family donated to this this country in the beginning you, your family was not involved with that part of it i imagine they were probably shocked uh, as to what happened and who really was running this country yeah well from what i remember my mom telling me and from what i've read and heard uh, the carroll family was uh, a jesuit catholic family they were jesuit and uh, I'm not, and I'm not Catholic or Jesuit, but I was born Catholic. Uh, uh-huh. But uh, but the mere fact that it was a Jesuit family, and they were, and, and from what I gathered, it was a very wealthy family, and they had a lot of land, and uh, uh-huh. and they donated a, a large truck of land, you know, to the government. Yeah, yeah, it is. Who who so, do you think uh, laid out the grid? And it is a, a very specific uh, grid of intent. The geography of the city of Washington D.C. Who do you think did that? Jesuits well, I, or others? Uh, I'm sure the Jesuits, because they are very, very crafty people. Uh, they are very much involved in government and finance, high finance, international banking, world law, uh, all of the real power centers of the world today. Jesuits dominate. And so, uh, and so, I, I'm sure that there's a real story here uh, that I'm bringing out at the last minute before I leave this world. But at least, uh, at least, uh, it gives somebody opportunity to look into it for me. And I would not be a bit surprised if, if a lot of my ancestry has been wiped off, you know, wiped out, so that there's, you know, you oh, can't really erased, find it. of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it sure. wouldn't surprise me any, but I just remember what my mom and my, and her sister and mm-hmm. and when my aunts would come over, my mom's sister, they would talk about the Carroll family and 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 I I, I think I said my mom had two uncles who lived in my, my hometown, mm-hmm. and they were both appointed to the federal bench. <clears throat> One was Bob Carroll, and the other was Frank Carroll. Mm. And so I know, if nothing else, I do remember going as a little kid with my mom to see uh, mm-hmm. two federal judges in town. I didn't mm-hmm. know what it was all about, but I was going to see her uncles who were the Carrolls. Mm-hmm. So I know that that's legitimate, and I know that the Carroll family were involved with the founding of this country. As a matter of fact, I think one of the John Carroll signed the Declaration of Independence. And he was the only Catholic. Uh, to do so, and it was either the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence that Carroll signed, and so his name's on there, John Carroll, and so 
I just thought that was uh, of, of value, even though it doesn't mean anything for me, but at least it is of value to know that, uh, you know, what, what my ancestry is all about. <clears throat> but anyway... Um, here's, uh, here's, hold on. Uh, Charles Carroll, C-A-R-R-O-L-L, of Carrollton. Yes. Double R, double L. Uh, signatory of the Declaration of Independence. Yes. He was That's elected him. to the Continental Congress on July 4th, 1776, and remained a delegate until 1778. How's that? That's exactly right. That's what my mom was telling me. Yeah. So, Good job. Well, you know, and, and, that, and when you think about it, Jordan, I, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt, right. but no. you, you look at it now, and the hope and the vision and the goodness that went into this whole establishing of, of the country, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the greatest document probably in, in history, <clears throat> and look at the at the actual blackness that is Washington, D.C. It's the center of Luciferian satanic evil on the planet. That oh, argument can be made. Of that, there is no doubt to anyone with an IQ of uh, over 40 that Washington, D.C. is the uh, uh, as the center for all of the demonic depravity and filth that's going on on the, on the inhabited earth. And it's my country I was concerned about America because I grew up in a country that I loved and my family worked in right. and all of my family you know, worked hard uh, to 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 be a part of America and only to find out that it's been taken over by criminals, yeah. liars, yeah. And thieves. Well, there's, and, uh, there's world so. Zionism. Charles Carroll never would have imagined when he signed the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776, <laughs> That yep. the net result would be what we're looking at right now. You're right. No exactly way. right. But just keep in mind, though, that 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 that, that family was a Catholic Jesuit family. Yeah. Well, that underscores that, the argument that the Jesuits are are maybe at the top. Yeah. Well, that's what I think. That's that's what I choose to believe based mm -hmm. on my 56 years of looking into all of this. But then on the other hand, it's always amazed me that this is what's always been in my blood. As a child, I was always interested in the dark side of things, and the political, and, you know, and asking the right questions to find out what's really going on. Right. And uh, then I come to find out later on in life, when it's too late, <laughs> of my ancestry. But I do think it's interesting. I've spent my whole life pursuing knowledge of politics and religion, and right. and and you know, and the real conspiracies behind all of this. So that, like Truly. I said, that yeah. two bucks would get you a cup of coffee. But anyway, I just wanted to establish all that right. to start with. That's a great opener. All right, and, Maestro. Uh, Thanks. And so in 1989, now I've had so many uh, strange experiences even as a child, but we'll get into some of those things later. Uh, but I think a, a, a nice place to start would be in 1989 uh, in Los Angeles. I, I went to a, a Whole Life Expo, which our dear friend Paul, <clears throat> Paul Andrews was putting on a masterful show called the uh -huh. Whole Life Expo. Right. And, uh, and, <clears throat> I only had a few bucks on me, but I was going to see. I didn't know what it was all about, but it looked interesting. So I went to this big conference uh, at the uh, at the Hilton Hotel, at the airport Hilton. And my God, there must have been 20,000 people there. It was an enormous event. And I'm walking down the aisles, <clears throat> and, of course, all of the vendors all have big tables. They're all in a line. And they got big signs on each table, and I came across a table of a, of a psychic, and his picture was up on the wall, and his and his name was Kenny Kingston. Oh and, sure. Uh, yeah, and Kenny Kingston was supposedly uh, you know referred to as a psychic to the stars. Kenny was <clears> on the program here several times. He, yeah, uh, and Kenny was fascinating. I, I used yeah. to do shows with him. I sometimes oh, come on as a really? warm up. Yeah, I used to do warm up for him. I, no kidding. I, I, talk, 
I'd come on and talk about the occult world and spirituality, et cetera, et cetera. And then I would introduce the speaker, Kenny Kingston, you know. So I, I was very close friends with Kenny. But anyway, <clears throat> when I first met him, uh, I, I saw his picture, and he had all of these pictures on the wall of him with famous people. I mean, the the, the queen mum and, oh, the top, and, uh, and, top and all of the yeah. royalty of Europe. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, and he was said to be the psychic to the stars. Well, at that time, I didn't know what a psychic was. It wasn't interested, but I was interested in the fact that this man has, has seen in the company of some of the most powerful people in the world, and whatever he's doing, he must be doing good at it because he's with all these important people. So I thought, I, I want to see what he's doing. <clears throat> And so the, I came up to the table, and um, and there was a sign that said, for ten dollars, you buy a, a little audio tape, or a, or a little pamphlet <clears throat> that he wrote about spirituality, etc. And uh, he would give you a one-minute complimentary reading to show you what he can do, to give you a, a psychic reading. And so I thought that sounded interesting. It's only ten dollars, so. So I, I got the uh, pamphlet, and I was reading it. Well, the way it worked is that there were so many people in the aisles <clears throat> that uh, if you're going to talk to Kenny, you have to line up next to the table, single file, and you go to the end of the table. The next person to see him would go to the end of the table, and Kenny was facing away from the aisle, facing away from the, the people. Uh -huh. So you have to go around and then turn around and now facing him and, and talk with him. <clears throat> and so uh, I was reading the pamphlet, and it didn't occur to me that I was I was holding up the line until I looked up and I saw that the person ahead of me had already gone and talked to Kenny and, and left, and, uh, and, and, uh, and I was holding up the line. And so the moment I saw that, uh, Kenny Kingston turned around. He had a swivel chair. He turned around to see if there was anybody else in line, and our eyes met. And the first thing he said to me, I had never seen him before. I had no idea who he was or what he could do or what he was doing. And when our eyes met, he pointed at me very deliberately, and he said, You've come back. They have brought you back. And I, and I said, Are you talking to me? He said, Yes, you. You have come back. And, and I said, I don't understand. He said, you are going to expose religion, the demonic depravity of religion and government. You're going to expose conspiracies around the world, and you're going to be very famous doing that because they have brought you back to do that. And and I was I was amazed what he was you know what he was talking about. And he said, they have brought you back. And he said, and then he said you are going to make some of the most powerful enemies a man can make in this world. But at the same time, you will attract the attention of some extraordinarily powerful people who will know who you are, and they will know what you are doing here, and they will protect you, but you will never know who your protectors are. You will never know who your enemies are. But... The people who know who you are and want to protect you so you can do your job, he said, they are going to put a circle around you, which means out on the street, wherever you go in this world, whatever you do, <clears throat> there's a circle that's been put around you by some extraordinarily powerful people in this world that uh, are protecting you. And that circle simply means nobody to touch you, nobody. And he says, so they're doing this, but you don't know who they are, but they know who you are, and they are protecting you so that you can do what you have to do. So I, you know, that was one of my first entries into the world of psychics, and and I had other, you know, other experiences with Kenny, but that was just the beginning to awaken. Kenny was up. A, a a very nice man. I, I oh, always very, enjoyed very, very. being his energy was very. Kind, caring, and uh, sprightly, almost. He was uh, oh yeah, interesting. Yeah. 
I, and I love Kenny, and I used to, like I said, I've done shows with Kenny and introduced him at different uh, conferences, and he and I would speak on the stage together. So, uh, but anyway, that was that was one uh, that was one of my beginnings, uh, and then second, uh, I was uh, I was asked to speak at a conference, and I've spoke at at so many conferences and conventions and seminars all around the world. But I was asked and back in the, I think it's about 1995 that I was asked by uh, the conference people to speak at, as a, and be a keynote speaker in Pasadena at a big UFO kind of a convention. And uh, so about a week before the, the, the conference, uh, the owner, the guys putting it together, uh, called me and they said we're going over to Pasadena to look at the hotel uh, that that we'll go, you know, you'll be speaking at you want to go with us and I said sure so we went over and we're looking at the room and and what is, you know what it's going to be like when we get there and then they said to me we were sitting in the lobby and they said to me <clears throat> what are you going to need uh, for your presentation, do you need a blackboard or do you need a, uh, a projectors or what is it you're going to need to do your presentation? And I said to them, look at all I want is just a table. I want a table and a chair, period. I want to be able to sit before uh, an audience like a teacher with all of my documents and papers and everything laid out on the table. And so I just want to talk to the audience uh, without any glitz, without any glamour, uh, and talk with them about the, the, the kind of research I've been doing. And so uh, the, the, the guy who owned the conference said, he said, okay, here's what I'll do. Uh, I'm going to put uh, a camera, a video camera uh, on you uh, and, and on stage, and I'm going to have the, the cameraman sit in a... Uh, uh, a bar stool behind you with the camera behind you so that when you pick up the piece of paper and talk about the document, hold it up so that he can zoom in on it because he's going to be right there over your shoulder uh -huh. the whole time. So hold it up so he can zoom in on it, and we'll have closed-circuit TV so everybody will be able to read it together. And so that next week it came off fine. It came off great. And, uh, and, and, uh, so at the end of the evening, when we were all going home, the guy who was uh, sitting on the stage with me, the cameraman, he came over and he said, Jordan, my, my wife and I would like to have you come to dinner tonight. Would you come over? And I said, of course. So I went, uh, I, I followed them home and they lived in Pasadena at a very nice, uh, uh condo upstairs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, his wife was in the kitchen fixing dinner, and uh, he and I were sitting in the front room gabbing about UFOs and everything else, and we were just sitting there talking. And then uh, after a little bit, the wife comes out and says to him in front of me, she said, have you told him yet? And and I was it was kind of shocking to me. And he, and he said to her, "No, I wasn't going to tell him till after dinner." <laughs> and I said, "Tell me what?" And he said, "Well, I I got an ulterior motive for inviting you here. It's something I have to tell you." And he said, "I've told this story to so many people. And my wife has heard it over and over, and now I am going to tell you a story from long ago." And he said, "I just turned fifty years old." just uh, about a week and a half ago. And he said, and when I was 17 years old on the East Coast, I think he said Massachusetts or somewhere like that on the East Coast, he said, one summer my, I, I was thumbing my way after school was out. I was thumbing my way to go visit my cousin. And he says, so I'm out on the highway thumbing a ride, and this old man in a beat-up, dirty, filthy uh, pickup truck that looked about as old as he was. And he said, but at least he stopped and gave me a ride. So he said, when I got in, the, the cab smelled terrible. He was smoking cigarettes, pipes, uh, you know, all kinds, of, anything that would burn, he was smoking it. And he said, it stunk terrible. It was an old man, but at least it's a ride. And he says, as we were driving off, 
he began, this old man began telling me everything about me and my family that nobody would know. He was telling me about my, my dad's work and his partners and my girlfriend and my mother. And, and he said there was nothing he didn't know about us exactly correct. And he said, I was astonished that this old man knows so much about me and my family, and he's absolutely correct on everything. And he said, when he finally let me out, as I was getting out, he told me, he said, everything I've told you up to now was to get your attention and to entertain you. And he said, before you go, I'm going to tell you something important now. He said, after you're 50 years old, you're going to be on the other side of this country. And one morning, you're going to be in a big hotel and a big meeting room with lots of people, and you're going to be sitting on a very tall chair on the stage with a man who's sitting at a table on the stage, and you're going to be, uh, uh, you're going to be uh, uh, with a camera. And that camera, he said, uh, the old man told him, that camera does not exist right now. But it will exist then. And you will be operating that camera over his shoulder so that whenever he picks up a piece of paper, the people in the audience will be able to see it. And he says, so when that happens, you tell that man, I put him there. It was my idea for him to sit at that table and that chair with you sitting behind him with a camera. I put him there. So you tell him that. So he'll not, he won't misunderstand and think it was his idea. Right. You tell him, I put him there. And when he told me that, that so visibly sh shook me that I got up and left. I went outside and walked down the street, and I was really a afraid and he came out my friend came out and walked with me for a little bit mm -hmm. and he said well, i just had to tell you that because the old man told me to tell you that he put you in in uh where you were t this morning he put you there and it's his will not yours so i don't know what that means i have no idea and i'm not verifying anything you need to understand this i am not verifying anything i'm just telling you what happened yeah. Because so many times, uh, I, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about when I say I'm not verifying. You know, I, I may have some, I've had it happen. Sometimes uh, somebody will come up to me, some lady will come up and say, Jordan, I just think you're an angel. And I say, well, thank you. And I, I you know, whatever that means. So mm -hmm. I think, <laughs> then later on, I tell somebody on the on the radio show, I said, well, I had a lady come up to me a few days ago, and she thought I was an angel. Immediately, the next day, the, the, the web is alive and jumping. Jordan Maxwell said he was an angel. And, and you know, Jordan Maxwell must be a lunacy. He must be a, a, a loon, a goofy. He yeah. said he's an angel. Mm -hmm. And the point of fact, I, you know, I'm just amazed at what, what people will do to you when you tell them the truth. And the point was, I didn't say I was an angel. I merely said that this was what a young lady told me. And so this is why I'm saying, again, what I'm telling you tonight and what I'll tell you in the future. I am not verifying anything. I'm just telling you what happened. So anyway, that's uh, that was uh, as startling to me. That These are very, very interesting uh, markers along the roadway. Oh You've yeah, got so oh, many of them. Uh, yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, the other thing I was going to tell you about is that my dear friend, uh, he's gone now. I'm assuming I haven't heard from him in a long time. Was Bob Leeds? Bob was an important man in Hollywood and the motion picture business. And um, one uh, one morning, Bob, uh, when I was living in San Diego working for the Truth Seeker Company. Bob uh, used to come over and visit me all the time. And uh, and so he called me one morning and said, I, I, I want to take you to breakfast this morning. It's a Saturday morning. And so he came over and he said, any place you want to go this morning, I'm, uh, I'll, I'm treating you. Any place you want to go, you tell me and we'll go have breakfast. I said, oh, okay. So we got in the car 
And I told him, I said, I think I want to go to Escondido. Well, Escondido is a little small town north of, uh, of uh, San Diego. And so he said, well, I was thinking about something really nice in downtown uh, San Diego. And I said, well, I'm thinking in Escondido. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, there's nothing in Escondido. I, and so I said to him as we were getting in the car, mm-hmm. you said I, you would go wherever I wanted to go. <laughs> and he said, yes. I said, well, that's where I want to go, Escondido. So he said, okay, we'll go to Escondido. There's nothing there, but... We'll go. So we, it's about a 20-minute drive uh, north to Escondido. So while we're driving, he uh, he and I got to talking about people that we admired in our life and friends that we've had when we were growing up and what they may be doing today or if they're even alive today. And I told him about a couple of people that I wish I could see that I went to school with and were very close to. And so we were just reminiscing about dear friends that we'd like to see and have lost track of. And he was then telling me about the two people in his life that was so important to him that he had lost contact with and didn't know anything where they were at all. And he said it was an old, the, one of them was an old Native American uh, uh, Indian uh, that he grew up knowing and was mm-hmm. kind of like a, a, a second father to him. Right. And he said, and the other one is a contractor, building contractor uh, that uh, I went to school with and, and, and we hung out together and was roommates in school. And he said, I would love to see him, but. Nobody I know that knew them knows anything about them. Nobody knows where the old man is or the or the contractor friend of mine. Nobody has ever heard from them again. And he said, I would just give anything if mm-hmm. I could see them again. So we get into uh and we get into Escondido and there's nothing there and so we're driving down the main street and there's an I hop. And so uh I said, That's where I want to go, right there. And he said, that's the IHOP. Anybody could go there. And I wanted to take you to someplace nice. And I said, I said, Bob, you said I could go where I want. That's where I want to go. So he said, okay, so we'll go to IHOP. So we, we get out of the car, and the place is crowded because it's the only place in town to have breakfast. And so he and I go in, and we wait for a few minutes, and we finally get, we finally get a, a seat. And they put us in the back part of the uh, of the restaurant. And when we sat down, I was facing away from the front entrance. He was looking toward the front entrance. And I noticed immediately when we sat down, something very, very bad happened, or something happened, because his his whole demeanor changed immediately. And I, I saw in his face something very fearful or something very, very, you know, very bad. And I said to him, Bob, what's wrong? And he, he didn't even hear me. And I tapped him on the on the arm and I said, Bob, what are you looking at? What's wrong? And he said, there is the old Native, Native American man sitting right there. And there is my uh, contractor friend, two seats down from him. There's both of the people I just told you I wanted to see, and but goddamn, if they're both sitting right here in the restaurant uh, in Escondido, and I would never have seen them had you not demanded to come here. He said, and he couldn't huh. believe. He said, how do you do that? I just got to telling you who I wanted to see, and there they both are. So, I don't know. I don't what know a how. shocker. Well, no coincidences, eh? No, I don't think so. Not with the no, right no. people involved, anyhow. <laughs> You're right. Uh, then, let's see, there was a couple so of So did he things. go over and talk to these people? Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. He got up quickly and went over to talk to them. And um, and, uh, and and I, I think, the, if I remember right, he he's pretty much stayed over there between the two of them, back and forth, back and forth. Well, understandable. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so, well, well, that was very nice of you to make that introduction again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I have no idea in the world how it worked. And then on the way back uh, to San Diego, we were talking about 
uh, he was saying, uh, who are you? How did, uh, he said, I, every time I'm around you, strange things happen. <laughs> Uh, and and it's kind of like there's a vortex of strangeness around you. And he said, uh, Bob Lee said to me as we were going home, he said, I f- there's some kind of a vortex that's spinning around you, I feel. That's my thought. And he says, it's like a swastika. Uh, got, the, the sun is swirling around, and, and I kind of see the, the vortex around you like a swirling sun or a swirling swastika, or something like that, around you. Hmm. And and uh, and then he said to me, uh, there's something strange about you. And then he said to me, where were you born? Where did you come from? Where were you born? And I said, oh, I was born in Pensacola, Florida, uh, the big Navy town. And he said, oh, okay. So then when we got home, he said, well, let's go out to a movie tonight. So I said, okay. So he came by that evening. And we go out to the movie, and what, what he wanted to see was Contact with Jodie Foster. Uh huh. And so he and I are at the movie, and uh, we were talking about the, what he is, you know, what had happened today. And 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 so when the movie starts, first of all, uh, there's a little girl. When Jodie Foster was supposed to be a little girl, yes, yes. she was in her bedroom talking to someone. And this whole movie is about contact and about aliens and, and, and other life forms and other worlds. And so she's uh, she's uh, on her ham set, and her father comes into the bedroom in the movie, and he says to her, who are you talking to? And she says, I'm talking to my friend in Pensacola, Florida. And he looks at me and shooks his head, because that's where I'm from, is Pensacola. And that's in the movie. She said, the little girl said, I'm talking to my friend in Pensacola. And then later on in the movie, not too long after that, uh, Mm -hmm. it shows the the, uh, the laboratory Mm -hmm. where they're picking up a signal from outer space. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and so they go run over to the computers and flip on the screen to see what they what they're hearing and see what they can you know see, and they begin to see some kind of a strange vortex. Uh, if you remember in the movie, they're seeing a strange vortex of some kind, and as they begin to uh, uh, focus in on it, it then becomes very obvious what it is. It's a swastika. If you remember in the movie, it was a swastika. A Maxwell vortex, a swastika. Yeah. <laughs> there you and go. so, and he looks at me and shakes his head because he just got through saying on the way to there that, uh-huh. that, 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 that the vortex is like a swastika. Well, there it is. And then I told him I'm from Pensacola, and that's who she's talking to is Pensacola. <laughs> so very you know, funny, like very this. interesting. Yeah, you know, you so, mentioned the swastika. And vortex in the same sentence. Very few people think of the swastika in a vortex sense. But when you look at it, think about it, it's right there. I don't know That's why exactly people right. miss it. That's exactly what it is. We've been it's so damn conditioned to see it as, as right angles and nothing moving and this rigid symbol. No, it's a, it's a, a symbol in motion. It's a vortex. I, uh, yeah, that's right. It is, and uh, like you said, most people never even think that that far. No, no. Because you have to be trained in uh, symbolism to pick up on things like. Well, hell, that. we're trained about the the swastika, but it's it's not in the vortex sense. It's you know the old Adolf Hitler evil Nazi thing. That's all people think about, and but look that's at it as just a, an artistic. Or a, a cosmic symbol, which is really how it started out as of course eons ago. This mm-hmm. has been around a long time. And what a lot of people don't know about the swastika, one of uh, the Army's larger divisions used the swastika as its its emblem in the beginning yeah. of World War II, and they had to drop it. No doubt about it. You're right. <clears throat> um <clears throat> Another uh, strange experience. Um, I went on Tom Likas' show in Los Angeles. He had a major show in L.A. back in '89, uh-huh. uh, and so I, he, uh, his producer called and asked if I would 
uh, you know, do a live interview, come down to the station and be on with Tom Likens. Uh, they had seen my first video, and so I went down, and um, so I went on Tom Likens' show for an hour, 90 minutes, whatever it was, and uh, I got an invite uh, after the program was over, I got phone calls, of course, and I gave my telephone number, and, and so I got a phone call from a guy who said he was a producer in, in New York on ABC Network, and he wanted me to come to New York to do a show with uh with uh what was the guy's name uh, can't remember his name right now but uh, I'll think of it in a minute and so I was supposed to go to New York to be on this radio show in mm-hmm. ABC New York mm-hmm. and so I did and um uh, a talk I, I, a talk was, show it was uh what was his name he was uh, Bob Grant Bob Grant Bob Grant okay I was on Bob Grant's show. Um, and they flew you to New, New York, York to do this. That's interesting. Yeah, they didn't just so, put you on the phone. Hmm. Yeah, and so, uh, no, he wanted me there in, in, in the studio. So I, I flew back, but I was up for a couple of days preparing, trying to prepare, because I've never done anything this big New York, ABC New York. Sure. And so I was scared to death, but I, I you know, but it was part of who I am or what I do, so I got ready. Well, I had to take a red-eye flight and got there at about 5 o'clock in the morning into New Jersey at an airport, mm-hmm. and I was so incredibly tired and so sleepy that uh, I, I, I it was amazing that I was still alive to walk. I was so tired. And so I decided not to go into New York, but just to stay at the hotel uh, at the uh, New Jersey airport. Uh huh. And so I got a room. It was up at the top, like a nine or ten stories up. <clears throat> and I, I, when I finally got to the room, I was so out of it, I just plopped on the bed and lay back on the bed. And I was... And, for a moment, I thought to myself, what am I doing? I'm in the, going to New York tomorrow to be on ABC. I don't even know what I'm doing here. And uh, <clears throat> so I said out loud, I said to the room, is there, is there someone here to guide and help me? Or am I doing all of this on my own? And when I said that, the bed began to rise. And I sat up quickly because as tired as I was, when your bed starts to pick up and, and float in the air, you sit up quickly. Uh-huh. And I was amazed that the bed was starting to float around the room. And and I saw it going near the window, and I started to crawl to the edge of the bed because I figured if this, if this bed breaks that window and goes <laughs> out the window, I'm off the bed, that was for sure. <laughs> and so it got right up to the window, and then it turned around and began to float back toward the, the bathroom, and then it turned around slowly but surely and came back to rest exactly where it was. How far and off I the ground did it get, Jordan? How far? A foot off the ground? Uh, it was maybe maybe two maybe uh-huh. two because it was quite I was I was pretty close to the ceiling, and so wow. as it moved mm-hmm. around the room, I I was absolutely shocked. You know, I was in shock. <laughs> yeah. I could yeah. not believe this, this bed is moving around the room. But uh, when it finally came back and sat down, I remember distinctly. <laughs> I was so tired, I just said, thank you, I'm going to sleep. And I fell back on the bed and fell fast asleep. But the, but but that told me, yeah, uh, you what asked. What a funny story. And, and I've, I have no doubt whatsoever that's exactly what happened. Yeah, huh. and, and huh. like I said, I'm not verifying anything. I'm just telling you what happened. Yeah, yeah. So the next day you did the Bob Grant show. Yeah, I did Bob Grant, and, and and Bob Grant told me, look, and I'm not telling you what you can say or what you can't say. You can uh-huh. talk anything you want. And he said, but uh, Capital Cities Corporation out of Chicago owns ABC at that time. And he said, it just so happens that the seven guys who own Capital Cities happens by chance to be here in the studio today. Yeah. 
Don't put to any pressure sitting. on Jordan. No, no. Uh, <laughs> no. And he said, they're going to be sitting in the producer's booth watching you. <laughs> and he said, I'm not telling you what you can say and what you can't say. You're free to say anything you want. But just remember, oh. the bosses of all bosses are sitting there watching and listening to you. So just be cool and what you're going to say, you know, whatever you say. And so I've always tried to be a gentleman on radio and, and, and yeah. do what I do, you yeah. know. And so uh, I I was supposed to be on for a half hour. <clears throat> and that when we went to the break, at the half hour break, uh, the producer came in and he says, the, the bosses say keep him on for another half hour. And so, okay, so I stay on for another half hour. And then when we went to the top of the hour for the, for the break, uh, the the producer came in and said, the bosses love him. Keep him on for the rest of the program. Bump everybody. Keep him on. And so and then Bob Grant looked at me and said, well, they're the boss, so that's it. So you're on for another two hours. So I did a three-hour show wow. uh, with Bob Grant and uh, and. Uh, afterwards, when we were when the show was over, all the the big shots were all over at the water, at the water cooler talking, and I went over to thank them for their kindness. And the guy who seemed to be the speaker for the group, he said to me, he said, "Have you ever done your own radio show?" And I said, "No, sir, I have not." And he said, "Well, you want to think about it because we like you." And he said, "And uh, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere." If New York doesn't like you, you need to go back and get a job. But if 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 the people of New York like you, and he said we're getting phone calls as far away as Georgia, wanting to you to do radio with with other people, he said. So you've done pretty well for yourself for the first time on uh, on a network, and so you know that's where it went. And I I was very happy about that. And Bob Grant was very nice and. But that was something I was not expecting as a floating <laughs> a floating bed to let me know there well, was somebody there with me. I, I don't know which was, is more amazing, the floating bed or conquering uh A B C radio like that. Uh, with yeah. the big with the with God in the control room staring at you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. All seven of them were sitting there. I know how this works touching. in radio and that's that's a lot of pressure, boy. Oh, it was. I was scared. Bob shouldn't have told you. <laughs> I don't know what he's <laughs> doing telling you. Yeah, no, he just told me. He said, just remember, the bosses of all bosses are sitting right there behind that glass watching you. Well, he he <clears> was <throat> on radio for a long time. I, I don't know if he still is or not. I don't know either. I'm not sure, but he was so very nice to me. Very, very nice. I've heard only very good things going. about him. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was very, very personable and very nice guy. And, well, isn't uh, there a song, if you can make it in New York? Isn't, isn't there a song, if you can make yeah, it in New Frank York, Sinatra. you can make it in a, Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Frank Sinatra. And yeah. one other quickie uh, uh, experience I've had among the 40 or 50 we'll talk about later, but uh, I was up on, I, I went out to uh, the northern suburbs of Los Angeles to stay with a friend who had a home up in the mountains of, of Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, there's a young friend that I had with me at the time, and so he was invited to also stay for the weekend at this guy's house. So it was a triple-layered house up on the mountain. And so we took the top layer, which was a big bedroom, and uh, and so my friend and I were taking the big bedroom upstairs, and the rest of the family were downstairs. And so in the middle of the night, uh, my friend and I got up, and we decided to go up on the roof. It was a summer night, so we went up on the roof, had a couple of beers, and were sitting up there just talking and overlooking Los Angeles at night. It was sure. beautiful out. And we're just sitting there talking and um, and admiring the, the heavens. And for some reason, which I have no idea why, I said, uh, and he's sitting there listening to me, I said to, I looked up in the sky and I said, Almighty God, if you could hear me, would you please let a meteorite hit the mountain over there? And I pointed. And, the play, and when I pointed, a meteor came out of the sky and boom, hit the mountain right where I was pointing. And all the lights on the mountain, all everybody started, <laughs> all the lights came on. People went, what in the hell was that? It hit the mountain so hard. And it was a huge meteor. 
where exactly where I pointed, exactly where it hit. Well, a couple of ways to look at that. Uh, uh, a wish fulfilled or precognition of an event about to happen. Yes, yeah, and I don't know which, and, and I'm, I'm not verifying anything. I'm just telling you what happened. I well, don't know how it is... happened, and my friend still lives in the same city with me right now that was there with me. Uh, he's right here in the same town I am, and, and we've talked about that. And he's asked me, you know, how in the world did you do that? And I said, I don't even know what it is I did. 